יש? So there's reasons why JavaScript has been slow. Now, those of you who are real who are web developers out there and who have worked with JavaScript know all of this. But like Visual Basic, like Python, like Smalltalk, JavaScript is a dynamically typed programming language. Yes, we have lots of objects. They have methods. You can call functions on the objects. They have Properties, fields containing data. I'll call them both methods and fields properties. And they can be added and removed at runtime. To create a property X of an object B, you just assign to B.X. Of course, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with all this. So we can add and remove properties from an object. If you try and read a member of an object that's not there, you don't crash, you just get undefined. If you, there is no b.x and you try and read its value, you get undefined. So that means since you're going to have lines of code reading properties and the properties the object has could be completely different each time that line of code runs, we have to have some sort of lookup. People have done this with associative arrays using hash tables or looking using any of the other data structures for uh, dictionaries that we've used. And this slows things down a whole lot. Functions as well. You have to look them up. And a function can be assigned 
like a first class object and stored in a property of a uh, data ob of an object. That's how you call the functions. So there's lots of obstacles in making functions fast as well. So I'm going to talk about ways in which we made this fast in JavaScript, and that'll be the technical part of the talk. So besides speeding up each individual line of code and access to properties, we also have to do something about memory allocation. JavaScript is a garbage collected language, and people really notice when their browser pauses for a second or two in the middle of doing something. We needed to get the garbage collection delay times down, and we needed to handle much more, many more allocations and much larger amounts of memory used by big JavaScript applications than previous browsers had been able to do. So, a better memory management system, some way to tackle accessing properties, and compilation to native code were the three things that we added to make our new V8 JavaScript engine. The most interesting one to me, and the one that has the most impact on you as web developers, is the fact that we rely on the fact that JavaScript programs, even though you can assign arbitrary properties to an object, for the most part, work like programs in a traditional object-oriented language. Mainly, if you make a lot of objects, a whole lot of them are gonna be the same type. They're gonna have the same properties. If you make a whole lot of points representing objects in some geographic web application, they're going to have properties X and Y. You're going to have hundreds of thousands of those, or hundreds of them, and they'll all have the same properties. And when you, there'll be many functions that whenever you call them, you're going to give them points as arguments. So even though JavaScript lets you make very dynamic object models, most people are writing programs that could, for the most part, be written in C++ or in Java. If it wasn't for this, we wouldn't be able to speed up JavaScript so much. We rely on that fact that you could have defined classes with fixed properties and given your functions type declarations that would say they're always called with these. However, we have to learn these online as we run your program. So our engine finds out when a function is always called with the same type of object, it figures out what types of objects are in the system, and it compiles it to fast native code. So, we all know C++ and Java and other languages are fast, because when you define a C or C++ structure, you know where the data is. If you're given a pointer to a point object, you know that the x double or integer is sitting at offset zero and the y value is sitting at offset one. Your compiler makes native code that's built into this. It uses machine code instructions that look up data at offsets. It's all blazingly fast handled inside the hardware. And this is what we've had trouble doing in JavaScript. We've had to use hash tables associative arrays, and that is our fallback case. If you want to use objects as associative arrays, if you're storing some connection between names and IP addresses or something, sure, go ahead and use JavaScript objects the way that they're allowed to be used. Use them to store your associative array, and we'll do it pretty fast. We use a very good hash table system with quadratic indexing. But if you're gonna use a lot of JavaScript objects that are all objects of the same type, I'll tell you how to do it and I'll tell you how we make them run very fast. So, here's the example that we're gonna look, I'll explain, show a diagram of, and then explain again probably.
We have a whole lot of objects, and they all have fields x and y and a member function foo. They all have the same type, according to any naive definition of type, how you're used to using classes or types in traditional compiled languages. Okay? Well, there's a lot of redundant information. Yes, all 500 objects have fields named x and field named y. We don't need to save 500 separate copies of those names. We're going to make one map object that says what fields do these objects have, the names of the fields x and y, and say, OK, for all these objects, we're going to store x at offset 0 of the data array, y at offset 1 of the data array. We call this one data structure with all the redundant information, the information needed to look up a field, the map. And every object just has a pointer to the map and a data array containing the data specific to that copy of the object, the values of its fields. Okay. We're going to use what's called inline caching so that every time you look at an object, we will check to make sure that its map is the one we expect, and then we'll pull the data immediately from the right offset because we've pre-compiled the function based on the assumption the function will be used with that map, and I'll go into that. The first question, though, is how do we find out that there are these types, that all of these objects have the same map, and how does it work with the standard way of making a new object in JavaScript? Now, this is the most technical part of the talk, and I will promise all of you that as soon as we get to the end of this most interesting part of the talk, from my perspective, I'll let you know and we'll switch gears again. So here's JavaScript code. We know that we make new objects in JavaScript by calling a function, saying new point of x, y, and that assigns to this dot x and this dot y. That's how we create for every new point the properties x and y belonging to that point. So let's see what happens when we call that. We made the function by running a function definition statement. It was JavaScript code that runs that creates the function point. And that function object sitting in memory and the label point has a pointer to this function, has a pointer to the starting map. When you make a new point, each time you call the function point, every new point object points to the initial map right there. And it has a data array. When we compiled point, we noticed that it assigned at least two fields, and we pre-allocate room for more than two fields for that point object. This shows us having a data array of size three. We've been doing two extra fields beyond the ones that we see, and that's usually worked pretty well, though we tend to waste a little bit of space there. So we have a new point object when we run the first var p equals new point of one, two line. We call the constructor, it makes point p, it has an empty data array, and it has map zero because the two assignment statements in the constructor haven't run yet. This dot x equals x and this dot y equals y. When the first one runs, we create a data field x. The first time this happens, we look at the existing map and say, we're going to add a field x to this map to make a new map. The map class 1, what we call a hidden class or a map, has the name x and the offset at which x is stored. As I say, we're going to store once for all objects the fact that they have a field named x and that that data for that field x is stored in slot 0 of the array. So now p has a field x, and p dot x is equal to 1. p's data array, the lowest thing there, has a 1 in its first slot. That's the per object data. And the map, which will be shared between objects, says it has a field x. Same thing happens when we add the field y to it. We add, create a new class that says this object has two fields, x and y. Their data is stored at indexes 0 and 1. And we put p's data, which is 2, 
into P's data array. Okay. Well, that's a lot of extra work compared to just adding things to an associative array. We better recover the cost of this work at somehow, and we do recover it when we make the second object of the same type. The next line, var q equals new point of 3, 4, makes a new object q by calling the same constructor. Q starts by pointing to the initial map. This time, when we add x to q, add q's field x, it notices that we've already created a new map by adding field x. That's called a map transition, and we stored a pointer there. The delta x says, if you add x to this map, go to this map that we've made already. So q follows the same path that p followed, it adds its own particular data. Q's data is different than P because we gave the constructor different arguments. But Q ends up with the same two named fields containing different data. P and Q point to the same map. Now that is just a data pointer sitting in our representation of points P and Q. And that pointer is what we check when we check the map of an object. Well, what do we do now that we have all these objects pointing to maps? The fact is, we're going to compile all the functions to machine code. And the machine code will be based on the fact that 90% of the time, when we look at a local argument to a function, it will have the same type. In other words, most of the time, we're going to hit a point or some other class that you've written your program to use. So JavaScript is not as dynamic at runtime as it potentially could be. It's not true that all objects have different named fields. And we're going to use our optimization techniques to make it run fast in this case. We have to take care of the fact that we need fallback positions, though. We need to spot when this isn't true, and we need to be able to fall back to normal lookups of a named field at, in an arbitrary object. We do this by calling at each property access site a little stub of code that we replace with the appropriate one based on whether we're in the fast case or the slow one. Okay. A property access site is just a, a fancy name for any time that we use a field of an object. P dot X, we either assign to it or we take its value. Each time we hit one of these sites, the assembly code has a call instruction to a little stub in assembly language. The first time we call a function and run the machine code, we don't know what type it's going to see. In that case, this stub code is the uninitialized state. The stub code, in this case, looks at the object that we're uh, fetching the property from, says, OK, it's a point object. I'm going to remember that for future use. It has to do the lookup of looking in the map to find all the named properties. It looks for the field called x in that list of named properties. It does this just through a binary search, since those names are sorted. It's pretty fast, but not optimal. And so the first time through this code, it's not especially fast, but it remembers that we saw a point there. The second time we go through the code, it sees a point there and changes the stub so that in the fast case that we always look at the x field of a point, it's not going to do a lookup in the map. All it's going to do is look at the map, check that the map is the map of a point, and then just fetch from slot 0 in the object just an assembly language load from offset zero in the object's data array. We're going to see the assembly code for that next for the fast case. 
On the other hand, if you ever call this function with something that's not a point, we give up. We go back to the case where we look at every object's individual map, look up the field named x in that map through a binary search, and then fetch the data from the offset that we got that way. So here is the assembly code. For those of you who really love technical details, this is the best slide. And for the rest of you, it's the end of the technical slides, most technical slides of this talk. So I said, we're loading point.x. In the actual compiled code for the function is the first two lines. That's in our function, which is some um, machine code, running all of those. And to get point.x, we call the stub. Now, these inline cache stubs are then allocated in another place. We just have a pointer to call to them. And if we change the stub, we call something different instead. And this is a stub that checks the map and fetches the data. So what's going on here? First, we fetch point. Point is the object we're looking up. We have a pointer to it, it's, uh, and we store it into EAX. The next two lines are one of the other V8 optimizations. Mainly, we work with objects. We have a whole lot of heap allocated objects. They can be JS arrays, JavaScript objects, dates, regex things, uh, floating point numbers. However, for the case of an integer that's less than 2 to the 30th, or greater than negative 2 to the 30th, we store it in 31 bits of a pointer and use the last bit of the pointer to distinguish between integers and valid pointers. You know on a 32-bit machine that all your pointers are going to be even. In fact, multiples of four, as long as you keep things aligned. And so we have two bits in every pointer that we can fiddle with if we're willing to go to low-level assembly language. And we could say that pointers that end in bit 00, zero are real pointers, and then pointers that end in one are instead 31-bit integers with a one as the last bit. Well, it's worse than that. In order to make arithmetic on integers work well, we turn say that pointers, en pointers ending in zero represent integers, and pointers ending in one represent real pointers. This causes a little mess in our C++ code because all of our pointers are off by one, but it's handled all through inline and uh, comp compilation and by the compiler. So the first thing is a test to see whether this is an integer or a real pointer to a JavaScript object. If it is an integer, then we jump to location 32 at the end, which is a uh, load miss in the inline cache. This is saying, we've bailed out. Our fast case did not work. Okay. Next, we compare EAX plus OXFF. OK, well, that's our address of the object. EAX contains the address of our object, except I said we added one to all our pointers. Address minus one is the real starting address of the first word of our object, and that's the map pointer. We compare it directly to the map pointer of a point. If it's not a point, then we bail out as well and go to the slow case. If it is a point, then we load the pointer to the points data array into, EB, into EBX, and then load the first element of the points data array there. It's actually at EBX plus eight bytes, minus one plus eight, because the first two words of even a data array hold a map and some length information. And then we return with the correct value in EAX. So that it took a while to explain. It takes a lot shorter time for the processor to execute, especially because branch prediction will guess correctly that those tests 
pass and we do correctly have a point object, and we have incredibly fast access to point.x in JavaScript versus what we have to do if we have to look up in a hash table, follow linked lists, look up in a binary tree or some other implementation of a general map. So that's one of the three things that make our JavaScript code very fast. And that's the one that I went into in detail. Now let's talk more in generalities about the other things that make V8 especially fast. One is, of course, there is no interpreter in here. JavaScript is totally compiled into code. We cannot interpret JavaScript code, even if we wanted to, because we didn't write an interpreter as part of V8. It gets compiled right now into x86 assembly language or ARM uh, code for our, uh, mobile devices. This is 32-bit code. We're doing bit twiddling, and we do some even worse bit twiddling during garbage collection. It will not be 64-bit code. It is a 32-bit virtual machine. But we compile co functions just in time. We don't compile them until they're actually called. We do a one-pass code generator, and right now we're working on making it a little bit more efficient using register allocation techniques and all the things we know of from compilers. Uh, and that'll speed it up some more in the future. Okay. So besides the fact that we run natively and we've solved this property access problem, the other JavaScript problem is that it uses garbage collection and dynamically allocated memory. We want to make a very fast memory allocator and we don't want long pause times. Now we take a well-known solution from memory management. We use the fact that in most programs, you make a lot of objects. An object either is used once or twice, and then you're done with it. You throw it away. It goes back to the heap and is collected. Or you keep it around. You've got some useful data in it. So objects in most garbage collected programs have either very short lifetimes or rather long lifetimes. It's a bimodal distribution. Well, when you have things that are of one of two types, you want to learn what type they are and handle it effectively. This way, we, this is how we use a generational garbage collector. This has two generations, the young generation, the old generation, or you might say two heaps, a new heap and an old heap. Whenever you create things, they're on the new heap. The new heap is optimized for allocation and getting rid of stuff quickly. If things stick along long enough, then they're put on the old heap, which is optimized for keeping data around, following its pointers to keep track of what's live, and so on. So we allocate objects into our new space and that's the objects that are going to die the soonest. That's where we get most of our memory reclaimed from. So we do the fastest possible gar garbage collection on that. We do a simple copying garbage collection where we follow pointers to find everything that's live, copy it over into a completely empty new space of the same size as the first new space. So for a new space of one megabyte, a typical size in our system, it goes up to two megabytes, we have two copies of that new space. We're using two megabytes of memory to implement one megabyte of very quickly garbage collected memory. The old generation, we use more advanced garbage collection schemes, either following all the objects and just marking the live ones freeing up all the dead ones and returning them to a linked list of free space, or much more rarely, packing all the live objects into contiguous pages without any free space gaps in them so that we can return free space to the operating system. Otherwise, we never have any completely free pages we can return to the operating system. That's the slowest thing. So our new space collections, the copy and collector, takes on the, or on the order of two milliseconds. Our mark sweep algorithm 
for just marking all live objects in both spaces and freeing up the space for the old ones takes on the order of 10 to 20 milliseconds and the slowest garbage collection that actually packs data together and returns free pages to the OS can take 20 to 40 milliseconds. But any of these, uh, some of these are much faster than sometimes that we had seen in garbage collectors on previous JavaScript uh, virtual machines. And I misstated, as I see from the slide, I was a little bit optimistic, but of course, we're speeding up these things all the time. Uh, it's saying 30 to 50 milliseconds for the mark free collections and up to 100 or more milliseconds on the slowest garbage collection. Still, hopefully enough that you won't notice as a user. The final uh, optimization in our virtual machine is not as crucial as the earlier ones. It's the fact that JavaScript has a large library, not as big as Java or some of these other things, but there's a number of built-in functions on dates, a number of regular expression functions built in, some fancy array sorting operations and things. There's a good amount of library code, built-in functions in JavaScript. Well, rather than implementing all of these in C++ as special functions, we wrote most of these functions as much as we could in JavaScript itself. This made it a lot faster for us to create the initial prototype, makes it easier for us to debug the JavaScript, but it also gives us the advantage that as we speed up our JavaScript compiler and make it compile and run your custom source code faster, it also compiles our native libraries to faster function calls as well. So we put all of our effort into making the machine code compiler efficient and create fast code. And that helps out not just your code, but our library code as well. However, there is a lot of library code and compiling it every time we start up the JavaScript VM is a little slow. So one thing we are able to do is take a snapshot of the heap of all the objects and code and functions that we've compiled already, store it into a snapshot file, and just load it from the file, create an already functional, partially running JavaScript virtual machine heap rather than starting from scratch each time. Well, that has brought us back down from 30 milliseconds to a much faster four to eight millisecond startup time for a JavaScript virtual machine. Okay. So to create a fast JavaScript machine and to be able to brag about it, but most importantly to create it and to keep improving it, we need benchmarks to run against. We need to find out when we make a change to the code, is it speeding up the virtual machine or isn't it? So we used all the benchmarks that are out there, but because we are aiming for a new target with this VM, uh, we're aiming for larger, more complex JavaScript programs than people have been using before. We've also taken some benchmarks from other programming languages and ported them to JavaScript. Things like constraint solvers for uh, constraint satisfaction problems, and uh, cryptography algorithms, encryption and decryption, graphics, ray tracer, and some scheme stuff. Now, we're not saying that you're always going to be running ray tracers and schemes in your JavaScript, but it seemed like a good thing to put this in the mix uh, together with all the existing benchmarks. So we have a set of new benchmarks available for other people to use, not just us, in testing JavaScript VMs and in making them run faster. We used other people's existing ones as well. And we have the entire source code for our JavaScript VM, currently with compilers for Intel and for ARM. Uh, it's at Google's open source depository, uh, code.google.com. And of course, we have a website and user groups available for this, chromium.org. And we already have external contributors making improvements to V8. So 
I'll finish up just by saying what I think some of the implications are for web developers. How can you make sure your code run, runs fast on this VM and hopefully also on some of the other new VM technologies that are out there? We know that both Safari and Firefox have recently had announcements of their squirrel fish and their spider monkey uh, tracing, code tracing projects and other techniques. And it's going to be quite a competitive field to see who has the fastest JavaScript VM. But we're happy that all these new technologies are appearing. And uh, we're going to see as how many of them we can combine. But what you, we want you to do, if you want your code to run fast, at least on our machine, is when you're writing a program that is traditionally object-oriented, you have a lot of objects with the same properties, well, make a constructor for those objects that assigns to those properties. <coughs> Try not to have a lot of control flow in that constructor or something, so they're always created in the same order. And all your objects will end up with the same map. Your functions, if you call them with the same object type all the time, Make sure that happens, and if there's one or two exceptions, be aware that that will mess up our fast case and make us bail out to the slow case until the next slow garbage collection. In case accidentally a function has been called a few times with different types of objects during some startup phase, but from then on is always called the same way, we do throw out all of the inline caches at the slowest type of garbage collection and recreate them. So even if we've given up, we're going to try again to do the fast case after the next garbage collection. Another thing is that there's a few things in JavaScript that cause a lot of havoc in trying to figure out where a function or where a property is defined, what scope it is. That's the with statement in JavaScript and exec statements in JavaScript. So you have to be aware that using with or using exec are very hard for us to implement the semantics of correctly. They're hard not just for us, but for all JavaScript interpreter writers. And they will often make us bail out from the fast case. Uh, function calls should now be fast. It's in inline code. So you should feel free to use function calls, local arguments, things like that, rather than with statements. Uh, I think that is pretty much all I had to say. Uh, I'm happy to end up, uh, hopefully, without using all our time so that I can answer questions from you guys, from developers out there, and also questions you may have more generally about Chrome. I focused on JavaScript because this is what we want to get out to people, the fact that we do want people to feel freer to write bigger, better JavaScript programs, hopefully that work well on our machine. And we're excited about the technology. This is my job. This is what I like doing. And I also am excited about all of Chrome. So I'm happy to answer any questions people have. Okay. I guess I don't have a moderator anymore. So I'll just start picking some people. I'll pick that guy in the fourth row. Okay. Uh, I have two questions. One is, do you have plans for 64-bit support? And the second one is, would you recommend using V8 for general non-web applications, not related to Chrome or something like that? Okay. The questions were, do we have plans for 64-bit support? And do we recommend using V8 for non-web browser applications? Uh, and the answers are no and yes, to be succinct. Uh, I won't be succinct. I will say that a lot of our speed optimizations are based on the fact that we do have a 32-bit object model. We are, at times, encoding almost two pointers into one in special ways that have to do with the amount of space allocated to stuff and alignment requirements. Uh, we don't see a need right now to go to 64 bits. We're worried about getting JavaScript programs to use tens or hundreds of megabytes of memory rather than the one megabyte or hundreds of kilobytes that might have been practical before now. So uh, we're not quite hitting the 32-bit memory barrier yet. 
That was the last, the second question is the thing that I forgot to mention. Of course, this V8 interpreter written in C++ has a stable API and can be used as a scripting language, not just for web browsers, but for any type of uh, application you want to script. We allow you to add C++ or other uh, native compiled code functions to JavaScript so that you can create JavaScript functions that will call into your compiled code. We also let your compiled code call JavaScript functions and manipulate JavaScript objects. So it's designed, as is any extensible scripting language, to allow plugging in your application and the methods and objects types from your application. The garbage collection has weak links and pointers in both directions that are correctly updated during garbage collection and relocation of objects, handle-based and uh, weak pointers. Um, and there is a concept called context where the same running V8 process can have mul uh, multiple JavaScript uh, context, separate JavaScript worlds with their own global objects, their own state, and uh, heap objects that don't interfere with each other. Okay, back there in the seventh row. When and if we are going to see plugin support for Chrome, maybe support for Firefox plugins? Yeah, I'll ask again. I'm asking about plugins. Plugin support for Chrome? Plugin support for Chrome, yes. Uh, well, there's two things. There's plugins and there's extensions. Right now, we are supporting plugins uh, using the, uh, I believe I'm correct here, the standard API for that. Uh, and then, the, uh, so that, of course, is running, we have the Shockwave plugin, Acrobat plugins, things like that are working. Extensions is something there has been a lot of call for, and uh, we're aware of that and are working on it, and we hope to add extension support as well. Now, because of the multi process model of Chrome, where things are sandboxed, uh, our extensions mechanism has to be a little bit different than the ones that have been used so far, and we're working on the design as well as the implementation of that. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Okay, how about you? Uh, could I elaborate on the heuristics and triggers for garbage collection? Uh, no, I could, but I'd say lots of wrong things. I'll say a few things about it. The copying garbage collection in the new space happens when the new space is filled up. Then we copy the live objects to the other half and hopefully free up some space. Uh, a lot of our internal code is based on the fact that we try to do various allocation operations, and if we're out of memory, we fail we fail back out of a few nests of function calls to the point where we do a garbage allocation and retry everything again. Uh, that means that we have to be able to do two or three allocations safely after one garbage allocation failure. Uh, so we need that invariant. We've m tried some various things of deciding if you keep allocating space uh, in big enough chunks, there's a limit when you hit it. Even though you're not out of memory yet, we're going to allocate more memory. But in terms of the heuristics, I just don't know the details of that. They are in the code. We are constantly changing them. I know that that's something that my people at the next cubicle are always going back and forth on. We've just recently changed some size limits, some sizes of heaps. And there are different heaps for uh, data objects, that don't have pointers on to other data objects, so strings and numbers, for code objects that must be executable, because this is a JIT uh, which creates compiled code and then runs it, we can't completely separate data space and code space. We have to have space that's both writable and executable, but we limit that as much as possible. 
uh, and map space where these special maps are is very highly optimized. They're all the same size. They're all together and collected separately. And the connection between old and new space is by what's called remembered sets so that we don't have to scan all of the old space to find the pointers to new space and the live objects in new space. Otherwise, we couldn't have a fast copy and collection on the new space. Yes. Um, so you've tried the one that there is right now? It's text based, yes. You can't, I can define a breakpoint. Oh, in a visual way. Oh, well, uh, I know we are, yeah, we're working on that. Off the top of my head, I can't remember the details. I know there is a, now, let's see, is it in the existing web kit there is a debugger that is better? Do you know this offhand? I know there is something we're hoping to hook into some existing system uh, that gives you more of a visual debugger. Uh, but I guess I'm a lot more tolerant and willing to get down to the nitty gritty because I've been using it as it is. But you're right, it is a text-based debugger and you have to go through and type in lines of co uh, code to change properties, to inspect the properties. And I can see how, yeah, a wonderful debugger like you have in, ID in most good IDEs would be nice to have. Yeah, uh, I haven't used that one, but if they have a good debugger like that, I know where people talk about it, and I'm not sure where the development is on that. You can certain, I'll tell people back at the office to make sure that details of what we've got in a debugger and what our plans are, are up on the website and have you look there or send me an email so I can get the, the exact status of it. But I know we are talking about improving the debugger. You said you took the benchmarks from uh, various programming languages. Did you compare the runtime with other languages, like uh, the Constraint Solver and other prog um, I think there was another one. So did you compare the runtime? Is there an improvement of? I'm not sure I got all of that. I said we took benchmarks from more traditional benchmarks from compiled languages and did them. We haven't really been compiling, comparing to other languages. We've just been worrying about other JavaScript interpreters. Um, you know, our goal is because JavaScript is so widely used, we have to make it fast and make it uh, usable and, and stable because people are going to keep using it. Uh, and you can ask again if there's something I missed in your question. It was just like a question like, is JavaScript now like four times slower than C? Something like this. Oh, how much slower is it than C or C++ or something? I don't know. Uh, I just don't know. Maybe someone out there has done some experiments. Everyone seems to be talking about how much faster or slower one JavaScript compiler is than the other and so on. And that's what we get bugged most about. So that's what we've been paying attention to. Okay. And the green shirt and white sleeves. Yes. Uh, in the in terms of service of the browser, it says that Google can do anything they want with the browsing history. I wanted to know why did you do that? Okay, this is about the installation of the Chrome browser and we can do anything we want to the browser what? I'm sorry. Uh, the terms of service of the browser says that Google can do anything with the information that goes through the browser, like the browsing history or the private information of the user. Uh, I think, are you talking about the original terms of service that went out for the first two days that the browser were released? Oh, maybe I'm not updated. Uh, yeah, that was a mistake. Uh, people just copied the terms of service from all the other Google services, like YouTube and Picasa and so on. 
And someone noticed that, and immediately people, we went out and changed the terms of service and made it retroactive to everyone. And uh, we're very sorry that we made that mistake, and we sure wish we hadn't. <laughs> Get the same one at the time. You can come and ask a question if you also come to practice. It's four o'clock. Okay, well, you're lucky you've got the other five And of course, I'll be around to answer questions. Okay, so if on my website uh, I have the same, on every page, the same uh, JavaScript library call <laughs> on the first thing on my page. I can tell your question already. <laughs> All right. Is it going to be, can we cache that can or reuse yes. that? Yes. We compile it and keep it. Uh, we are really working on that. We have, had, we have some prototypes, and uh, we're working on that issue. It's tricky to find out, you know, you have to do some sort of, like, signature to find out, is it the exact same Java code that you're compiling every time? But, yeah, we, are, we have, internally, we've been testing some stuff, and we sure would like to be able to cache JavaScript so we don't have to repeatedly parse and compile the same thing. Uh, not as much as we hoped. I mean, it seems like it sure would, but uh, we're, we're finding it hard to get a system working that creates the really big performance gains we'd love to see from that. There's some benchmarks that keep, you know, repeatedly compiling the same code, and it helps on those, but we're not sure if it'll make such a difference in real code because our parser is pretty fast. You know, parsing technology is well optimized, and our compiler is very fast and straightforward. So it's not n by no means a factor of 10 it takes to you know parse and compile code versus remembering it. Uh, so, okay. Well, thanks. Uh, I hope uh, at least some of you were prepared for such a technical talk about the fascinating things that. I think we do to make a new JavaScript compiler and make it run fast. And really the tips are feel free to do whatever you want with JavaScript, especially those things that look like a conventional object-oriented programming language, because we're hoping that you do that and that's what we can run very fast. Uh, and go to our code.google.com for all of the Chrome browser information for our V8 library. Feel free to use V8 to script things other than browsers. Uh, and we love to hear from you. So.